As we've heard, you're arguing that Donald Trump, with uh, his thought bubbles and mistrust of alliances and the lack of a clear foreign policy, is likely to have a greater impact on our region than elsewhere. So perhaps you could tell us why you think that's the case. Sure. Let me start, Joan, thank you for that, uh, by congratulating Jonathan and Mori. Uh, this is a publication that was that we needed, and so thank you very much for providing us with that, and we really wish it every success um, possible. So I think if you look objectively at our region, at the, at the Asian region, um, its reliance on American power to keep the peace, to hold the ring, has been much proportionally greater than pretty much any other region. The Asian region combines a number of attributes, and, and the main ones really are uh, the enormous power and potential power of the states here. Um, you could argue that there are other regions in the world uh, where some of the rivalries run just as deep, if not deeper, but the states aren't as big and powerful um, as they are here. Secondly, ancient rivalries and animosities run very deep in this part of the world. Uh, it wouldn't take much for some very significant powers in this region, many of them nuclear armed, some of them potentially nuclear armed, to start going at, at each other in fairly serious ways. The last one is that institutions have never mattered much in this part of the world. Unlike in Europe where NATO, the EU, the United Nations are taken very seriously and and the rules of the road that are set down are taken very seriously. In Asia, the command power of the state is much more important than external obligations to, to rules or institutions. So those three things mean that this is a very, very conflict-prone region, potentially. And what has kept it from being conflict-prone uh, has been the overwhelming, particularly maritime power of the United States. Uh, and. Uh, the willingness of most countries in this region to accept that it's simply not worth taking each other on, that they, that they were better off simply becoming prosperous. And secondly, up until probably the turn of the century, the unwillingness of serious powers in this part of the world to challenge US supremacy. And I would argue that that is the condition that has most changed. As we've already pointed out that <coughs> The dynamics of this region is different to say Europe, but in, in your article, as Jonathan's indicated, you also suggest that the way in which these countries in the Asia, Asian region perceive power is different from how we imagine, and therefore their response to Trump mm. may be different to ours. So can you expand on that a little more? Yeah, if I can be a, an amateur historian, Joan. <laughs> um, I mean, it's one of my pet theories that Westerners tend to see history as a as a straight line phenomena of human affairs just get better and better and better and humans get more and more sophisticated, whereas I think most Asian traditions tend to see history in a much more cyclical way of the rise and fall of power, the rise and fall of empires. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the mistakes we make is that they, we just assume that they see history and progress and international affairs in the same way we do. I think one of the things we've got to do in this country is realise that they see these things in very different ways. We look at American power, I think, as simply the culmination of a tradition of advancing democracy and liberalism and market forces and everything else. Um, that's why we become so outraged when we perceive American power being misused. I think that's less the case in, in our region. I think uh, American power is seen in much more pragmatic, dispassionate ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's simply, America is simply, or has been the latest of millennia of the rise and fall of powers. And American power is receding in the region. Chinese power is rising, and that is simply factored into a very cyclical view of history. Thank you. Now, huge topics there, but we are going to move on to the second paper for the moment. And uh, as we've heard, uh, this paper article suggests that there is a, a quite serious prospect of war uh, in, as a result of um, the crisis surrounding North Korea, or at least a realistic prospect of war. And, and I think you suggest um, that Trump's threats but they sound a bit like the schoolyard, are uh, genuine. And uh, so I wonder if you'd like to tell us what do you think might be President Trump's motivation for, for 
so clearly, at least in terms of rhetoric, raising the stakes, and uh, whether this might have something to do with domestic politics, or just tell us more about what you think um, <coughs> President Trump's possible objectives. Well, let me start by saying I share your concern and Jonathan's expressed concern about the kind of the, the dreary outlook that we outlined in the paper. And I had hoped that by the time that the article came to print, that things would have changed. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen this cheerleading team uh, from North Korea and South Korea, the Delphic smile of Kim Jong-un's sister, the first of the Kim family to be south of the demilitarized zone in the last 25 years. And I thought, well, maybe that might be a breakthrough. I had a chance to reread the article that Kim and I did together right before coming out here, and, and I'm alarmed to say that it holds up too well. You know, <laughs> some things you want to change, but unfortunately, the underlying dynamics there, and this goes to the root of your question, I, I've spent the better part of 30 years working on North Korea, and during that time, I've become quite accustomed to North Korean behavior and an alarming trajectory inside North Korea itself. And so I don't want to suggest for a second that there isn't something that the entire world community should be deeply concerned about in terms of the increasing range of North Korea's missiles uh, and their nuclear capabilities. Those are a, a challenge for the entire world. But I think what was at the core of our article uh, was not that, that trend, which has been relatively trackable for 30 years, but rather the unpredictability of the US response to that trend. Uh, and in the decades that I've been working in this issue, I have always been able to rely on the core assumption that whatever mistakes they might make elsewhere, that on the Korean Peninsula, the United States would be the adult in the room, that they would have a very clear de-escalatory strategy, off-ramps to avoid any escalation in that process, that they would carefully factor in to account the interests of our allies in the region, uh, as well as you know, the, the potential impact of any conflict on allies in the region, and the wishes of our allies in the region. Uh, I hope all those things remain true. I cannot say with great confidence that they do, and I can say with relative confidence that they are not primary considerations in the mind of the United States President at this time. Um, and so as to what's driving him particularly, um, you know, he was told from the very outset uh, in the briefings, the very few that he actually paid attention to, uh, from, from President Obama that this was going to be a major problem. And that was based on that known trajectory of the North Korean programs. Um, he approached it in, in typical way with a tweet in, in January of 2017 that said, this will not happen, period. Unfortunately, it has happened. Uh, and, and so the response to that is one in which there is a real concern about you know, how measured the U.S. response will be, how coordinated the U.S. response will be, and an apparent growing consensus within the White House uh, of the need for some type of a preventive, uh, preemptive war. And it is that growing consensus in, in, in that community, I think, that really drove the alarm that, that Kim and I felt and, and focused on. Now, what we didn't address, uh, because it seems to, to, to delve into the, the, the conspiratorial, is domestic politics. You know, it's the classic wag the dog scenario, which, you know, you don't want it to go into the realm of, holiday mo uh, of, of Hollywood movies. But in an environment now where there is a U.S. president who is coming under increasing pressure, and anybody who's followed domestic politics in the U.S. for the last several months and looks ahead at what the Mueller investigation is doing with Russia, one can anticipate that that pressure will only increase. You know, you don't have to be overly conspiratorial to think that there will be at least a temptation for action, which was, again, justified on its own rights from a U.S. America First perspective to be tied into domestic politics. So that's, that's a concern for sure. So, Kim, if that doomsday scenario eventuated, what, how would it, what would be the implications for Australia? How might we, our government position itself if, if the conflict were pushed to the point of actual armed conflict? Well, how the government positioned itself would be the least of our problems. Uh, were the calculations that uh, many in the American military now have, that they could do either a disarming first strike or a register, they don't, they don't use the term bloody nose, it's a journalist, but, a, but a, an exemplary demonstration, say, against a uh, test, that um, uh, it would not break out into a general exchange on the Korean Peninsula, ultimately involving nuclear weapons. And while it's absolutely certain Kim does not have nuclear weapons capable of hitting the United States, he probably does in relation to Japan, South Korea and maybe Guam. 
So it, these, if you didn't actually get everything, and that, uh, seven or eight of these things were cut loose, we would cease to have viable trading partners. And um, the, uh, the effect of that on our economy and the rest of it would be as nothing compared with whatever element of, uh, of armed force we managed to commit. I don't actually think commitment's a big issue for us in this sense. The Americans and the South Koreans have exercised this till hell froze over, uh, which happened a few weeks ago, and the, uh, or seems to be happening in Pyeongchang. But the, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the effect, uh, uh, the, I can only think of one element of our order of battle that might in, the, in any ways be useful to them, and I won't go into that, but we'll talk about it later. The, um, so I don't expect that anything other than support would be sought from us, but the consequence of the calculation being wrong would be enormous. I know nothing really about Korea, uh, but I got alarmed enough about it when I was in Washington towards the end of last year. I noted the fact that I was uh, uh, in the same centre as probably the, um, uh, a scholar amongst the top half dozen in the world on North Korea in Gordon. And so I... Uh, went through my particular uh, take on the American military and political elements I met when I was there. And it had been preceded by a debate I had in another forum with a US general, very senior ex-US general, in which he argued that the United States was already mobilising and, um, and that this would come to pass, and in which I argued the other way and said that he wouldn't, Trump wouldn't have the bottle for it. And when I um, eventually got to Washington, I found it was true. The United States was mobilising, forward positioning of munitions, uh, putting themselves in a situation where if a conflict emerged, they'd be likely to be ready for it. And, and therefore, one needed to take it all seriously and look more deeply. There's three characters, really, in the American administration who are critical here. One, McMaster, who's the... Uh, the um, uh, a principal, uh, principal advisor on strategic matters in the, in the White House. The other, Dunford, who is uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and Mattis, who is the Secretary of Defence. Uh, of the three of them, you'd say that McMaster and Dunford leant heavily towards uh, the possibility of an outbreak, uh, if it was necessary to their minds. In the case of Mattis, exactly the opposite, that... Uh, Mattis is determined to get a position developed that permits the US to do that, but he himself is desperate that there should be a conclusion because while he has assured the president that he has a plan that would minimise the possibility of damage in South Korea and Japan, he probably thinks that it might not work and, that, uh, and the consequence of that would be devastating. So Gordon came on board and that's it. <laughs> yeah, shades of August 1914 sort of hover around us, miscalculations and inability to control the logic of, of the forces you set in train. But over to Andrew now, and uh, your paper is, has a slightly different focus, but it talks about Australia's defence position and particularly the possibilities or otherwise of self-reliance and what how we should be positioning ourselves, particularly in terms of some of the President Trump's statements about allies having to do more to look after their own defence. So perhaps you could tell us really what, what your conclusions about the prospects of self-reliance are. We've already heard they know, but you can could, you could say more on that subject. Uh, well, well, there's a couple of different notions of self-reliance that need unpacking there. Uh, the, the, the Trump administration has been uh, lecturing its European allies in particular that he brought wants them to be more capable, wants them to spend more. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that he wants them to develop their own internal um, defence sectors. Um, and in fact, I think he'd be quite delighted if they spent more on bought American equipment. <laughs> uh, I, I think that would be win-win from Washington's point of view. Um, and Australia has, has largely escaped any of that sort of criticism, largely because, A, we are spending more, and we've been in, on an upwards trajectory for about the last four years now, and we're about to take off on a very much steeper one. Um, and secondly, we do buy a lot of American equipment. But the sort of self-reliance that I think that Washington is looking for is they want coalition partners and allies who can turn up to the fight 
and provide for themselves. They don't want somebody who turns up, runs up the flag and then says, where's the American intelligence support? Where's the American logistics support? Where are the American battlefield helicopters to move us around? Um, and we did a little bit of that in Afghanistan. We had forces there with insufficient mobility. We had to rely on NATO or American forces. Um, and, uh, you know, it, there's a political usefulness to having coalition partners turn up. Uh, but if they can turn up and look after themselves, provide for themselves, so much the better. And so how, re how realistic is that an expectation of our defence forces, that they can perform that kind of role? Uh, well, we're patchy, I think is the way I, I'd describe it. But if you look at the Air Force that went to Iraq and Syria in the last few years, uh, we turned up there with our own air-to-air -air refuelling tankers, our own airborne early warning aircraft. And, in fact, there were days when Australian tankers and Australian um, control aircraft were essentially running the air war and supporting other coalition allies. So we turned up with the whole package. And, and when you turn up with those assets that other people can use, uh, it, it's like a multiplier effect. So, so um, you become a very valuable ally indeed. So, um, as, as I said, it's patchy. I think there are parts of the Australian force structure where we would still rely on the support of others. Uh, but there are elements where we can pretty much do it ourselves. What we can't do, and what was the main thrust of my piece, is uh, design, build and support all of the equipment with Australian Indigenous industrial resources. Um, a, a country the size of ours, with the natural advantages we have and the disadvantages we have in an economic sense, simply doesn't have the economy of scale um, to do those things. And if you look at Europe, most European countries don't either. The, the trend in the last 20 years has been towards consolidation. Europe as a whole now produces a combat aircraft, rather than Germany, France, Italy, Britain all producing their own. They um, produce them in consortium. With the British wing falling off, perhaps. Well, <laughs> right. um, well I'd like now to just give the, the panel a few minutes just to sort of bounce off each other's ideas. I don't know if any of you, Michael, is there anything you'd like to respond to? Yeah, look, I'm, I, I might ask Kim, Kim and Gordon a question about the, the Trump foreign policy. I mean, you went through in great detail, mm. Kim, uh, about... Uh, who's in charge and everything. One of the things that I was in Washington a couple of weeks mm. ago, one of the metaphors that one of the people used to describe what was going on was that Washington is actually two governments at war with each other. Mm. That you've got the yes, traditional administration, the, yeah. the people on the ground in the Pentagon, in the State Department, in the intelligence community who are keeping things more or less moving along on, on, on dependable tracks. And then you've got the White House soap opera. And I wonder if you both could kind of reflect on who's winning and who's losing and, you know, what would be the scenario of that doomsday or that, that, that bad thing happening? What is the, the capacity of the underlying Washington to resist? Off you go, mate. They're all your so, so let, me, let me start off with this because <laughs> it's a really important question. Uh, shortly after uh, the inauguration, probably two months in, I, I wrote a, a short article which I entitled Follow the People. Uh, because I, having lived through 25 years in Washington and seen many transitions, was very much focused on who ran what office. It, because the US system is very different than Australia. In Australia, you know, again, given a parliamentary system and giving remarkably skilled and, and qualified you know, bureaucracies that kind of carry forward the policy, you know, where there's a change of government, there will be some changes in emphasis, but largely driven by the government, so to speak. Whereas in the United States, we have r remarkably talented bureaucrats, but they're all structured in such a way as to follow the lead from politically appointed officials. So there are normally, in a normal administration, some 4,000 politically appointed officials that come into a position. Of those, approximately 565 or so are senior officials that are Senate confirmed. I, when I wrote the you know, Follow the People you know, uh, you know, article, there had been only a handful, 20 of them confirmed. We are now over a year into his administration, assuming it's one term, a full quarter in the administration, and I believe less than 200 of those 565 positions have been filled. So it's really unfair to characterize it as a war between two administrations because there isn't one, mm -hmm. uh, other than one exception, and that is the Pentagon. 
you know, because the Pentagon has one, you know, you know, I think many of us viewing the administration, you know, a year ago thought, oh, thank goodness for the adults. Uh, that, that has been modified from the plural to thank goodness for the adult. Uh, and and uh, those people who are interested in foreign policy, international relations, international security really put an awful lot of weight in Mattis because he has the full weight of the bureaucracy of the Pentagon behind him. And that's enabled them to put out strategic documents which have you know, been well received in the region because they have the capability to do that. But if you look at the State Department, Commerce Department, all the others, they're very much at war with their own secretaries who have the explicit task of dismantling those organizations. Yeah. So it, it yeah. very much is real, it exists. But uh, one final thing that I'll point to that comes back to the topic of our paper and that really heightens my anxiety is that when you look at the people in that process, in December 9th of this year, Randy Shriver, a remarkable Asia specialist, a great China expertise, uh, um, was finally confirmed to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia and the Pacific. He now is the sole Senate-confirmed political f official in the entire Trump administration with an Asia background or Asia expertise. That's it. You know, there's a couple of other people who have been politically appointed in relatively junior spots, but that's it. And so th there really is nobody at home. So the last part of this play played out as T Kim and I were writing our article. A close friend and acquaintance of both of ours, Victor Cha, a professor at Georgetown University, mm -hmm. had been long presumed for the better part of a year to be the U.S. ambassador to South Korea. Uh, professor at Georgetown University had served in the Bush White House, one of only two people that I know he and Randy Shriver, in the foreign policy Republican community who didn't sign on the Never Trump letters, and so he was eligible. Well, he was not backed, I think primarily because of his opposition to the idea of renegotiating the, the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, but largely because of his opposition to the said bloody nose approach. Yeah, and, and so if you look at, again, across the entire political spectrum, and even if you look at just at Republicans, you'll find a widespread consensus of the risks associated with a preventative or preemptive attack on North Korea. Uh, and yet, those people are not in the administration. Mm -hmm. Kim, do you want to comment on what Andrew said about Australia's capacity in defense terms? Well, uh, what he said about uh, the situation in, in uh, the Iraq-Syria conflict, now, absolutely right, we took all our stuff to the party. What used to infuriate me as ambassador is we had the capacity to do that in Afghanistan as well, and we're damned if we do it. And um, so it wasn't an absence of kit that uh, that meant that we couldn't support our people in country with you know, choppers to move them around and uh, and were so dependent on, on American and other enablers. That was our choice. And um, we we the thing that Obama loved about us is that we would come to the party with a full capability that we are not a flag. And I remember uh, uh, Tony Abbott. I was petrified when he turned up in DC because he's the anti-Obama. <laughs> and, um, and, and I saw, saw the briefing books that came out of DFAT and, uh, and Prime Ministers. I was even more worried because I thought that Obama was going to give him a big workout. And... Um, and that, uh, so I put, spent a night writing weasel words to, uh, to give uh, the Prime Minister to use in what I thought would be a full court press on him. And he looked at them at Blair House and said, oh, don't worry, Kim, I'm going to be all right, that's all crap. Um, <laughs> and I said, fine. And we get over there <coughs> and you see it's the full court press. Uh, generally, it's just the President, Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor and, that's, uh, and then a few second-line individuals. It was the President, the Vice President, Sec State, Sec Defence, United States Trade Representative, National Security Advisor. Uh, there was, and he knew that we were about to be done over. And, um, <laughs> the, uh, and Obama begins, an immensely erudite, charming, beautiful five minutes, and you could see the little hooks in each of the things he said that you knew he was going to take up from global warming onwards. And you sort of sat, oh, God, this is going to be awful, because where you sit, normally you sit next to a minister and you keep writing while the other side's talking and keep pushing notes across in front of him or her. You can't do that in the, uh, the Oval Office. 
he's out of your control and reach. And Abbott, and then Obama finishes and he says to Abbott, um, is there anything you want, to say, you want to say, Tony, before we get into the, you know, the detail of this discussion? And Abbott responds and he says, yes, yes, uh, Barack, there is. Most people come here with a list of complaints. I've got no complaints about you. Or they come here with a list of things that they want. I don't want anything from you. I just want you to know that I think you're about to get into a lot of trouble in the Middle East. And when you do, we will be there in numbers. Oh, and there was a sort of... <laughs> ah! There's a, back in the room when, when he came out and said that. It's one of the, the giant falsehoods of, uh, of uh, reporting on the Australian-American relationship, that the Americans initiate and demand things of us and we respond. My experience, that only ever happened once. Mostly it's the other way around. And until there's a settled agreement, the Americans will never write you a letter because if you're going to say no, they won't write. And, uh, the, uh, and, and this was... But it was what Obama valued of us that we could do what Andrew said.